maybe of leadership is communication of some sort. So it's uh, clearly uh, a special case of how to use communication, namely to lead other people. So that leads us to the question of what leadership is. Now we will uh, do a little exercise in uh, linguistic and semantic analysis. Maybe you remember last year, I think I tried this on you, some point? Some of you still remember? If you don't, you will now have refreshed memories. Okay, uh, so we can just start to look at some linguistic clues here. The leader leads those who are led. They are sometimes called the followers. Sometimes people don't feel comfortable in thinking about that everybody that is led is a follower. Maybe follower somehow implies that you're a little too uh, unindependent, that you're just doing what you're told and nothing else. Um, I don't know, but it's hard to find the right word. Obviously you have leaders and you have those who are doing what the leaders are get, trying to get them to do. Uh, okay, and there are lots of expressions in English which have to do with this, like to be in the lead. To be in the lead also means to be first, right? To take the lead, uh, to lead the way, and if you want a short, quick definition of leadership, you could say it's the art of leading. So now we're going to do this a little more, this was just a, a first uh, taste. Now we'll go into this a little more deeply, and uh, we'll look at uh, two ways of doing semantic analysis. I think you've seen this before. Who recognizes these words, semantic field and meaning potential analysis? Nobody? Yeah. Two people. Memory training is what this group needs. <laughs> Well, we'll see. Okay. So anyway, we're going to look at this now. But the first thing is semantic field. That's where you look at other words uh, which have a similar meaning to some word that you're interested in. And then you're trying to find some dimensions that might help you to understand the concept, the meaning, which is associated with that word. Meaning potential analysis is another way of doing the same thing. These are two different ways of doing this kind of analysis. In meaning potential analysis, you rather look at how the word is used in lots of different contexts. In uh, semantic field analysis, you look at other words which mean similar things and see how they could be related to the word that you're interested in. So, let's start with semantic field, since I'm not going to spend so much time on that, I'm going to spend more time on meaning potential. So, 
So if we look at the semantic field of leadership, we find words like lead, head, head an organization, which is a metaphor from this head in many languages. Who speaks a language where you can talk about leading and then use the word head to do it? Which language? Russian. Russian. Yeah. So uh, I forget, but what is this in Russian? Galava. Galava. So you could also have Galavich. Something? Glava, which, you said Glava, which is old, uh, archaic word for head. Yeah. yeah, but do you have a verb? We have in Ukrainian. What is it? Holavate. Holavate. Mm -hmm. So Holava and Galava is the same. Yeah. Okay. GH, yeah. Yeah, so okay, so I'm sure if you, some other people might also speak such language. It's, it's pretty common to think of the head as the, as the leader. Direct. Guide, which is a slightly softer word. Govern, decide, rule, dictate, force, coerce. So here's getting into various different dimensions of leadership. So you can see here that coercion is one of the ways in which you can lead. You use force. Dictate. Tell people, you know, give them no options, just dictate what they're supposed to do. But it could also be softer. So, I mean, one way to, to, to use this kind of material is to sit down and think, what do these words show us about leadership? Some words go in one direction, other words go in another direction. How can we uh, somehow tease out the dimensions of leadership just by looking at the synonyms of leading? possible to do that, but it's not something maybe most of us can do in just one minute. <laughs> we need a little more time to think. But if you do that, you can spend a couple of hours on it, it can actually be interesting. You can learn things. Sorry. Okay, but I'm not going to spend so much time on this now, but I'm rather going to go to the next type of analysis which is then uh, uh, the meaning potential. So the meaning potential is to, to look at how a word is used in many different contexts. And it's, there is a shortcut. Uh, and that is if you, well, there are many ways to do this. But one of the shortcuts is to use what is sometimes called semantic role analysis. Semantic role analysis. So that helps you, or it's a way of understanding which roles are associated with a particular verb. In this case, the verb to lead. So roles here means the persons and things that are involved in leading. So who, the leader, also called the agent, and sometimes in social science, the actor. The leader, who leads whom, those who are led, the followers. For what reasons or motives? Power, money, I don't know what. Purpose, goals. With what instruments and resources? Guns, money, I don't know. There are many instruments and resources. Communication. In what environment or context? Are we talking about the government? Are we talking about a motorcycle gang? What are we talking about? In what manner and style? Friendly, aggressive, authoritarian. You know, there are lots of ways in which you can lead. For how long? Where, when, giving what results? All of these things in blue are semantic roles. They're all associated with the verb to lead. And this kind of analysis can be done with any concept where you can find an action associated with the concept. It's very often a way to get more deeply into the concept fairly quickly. You will see when you read the literature that a lot of the questions that are answered in the textbooks have to do with these questions. 
What are the reasons? What goals should there be for leadership? What manner should there be, etc.? It's these things, but you know, with a lot more text and a lot more talk about exactly how you do it. <laughs> so, from this you can extract a kind of formula. X leads Y with the reason R and the goal G, using instruments I, resources R, in an environment E, in a manner M at a time, T place T for a period, T and with results R. Those are just, you know, abbreviations, there's nothing special about that. But it gives you, in, you know, in a very compact manner, the important things about leadership. And this is, as I said, this is one example of what you can do with a meaning potential analysis. There are other things you can also do, but this is maybe the, one of the quickest ways to get into what is involved in a, in a concept which has a dynamic side. And, and that is true about leadership as well. Okay. <coughs> So now we can try a definition. And remember, definitions are to give necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for something. So here we're trying to define A leads B, and we get two cases. That is true if and only if A can direct B's action, behavior, and or thoughts. Now, this leads you perhaps to think in the first place of a single person. But if you are interested also in leading groups, which we normally are, we can have number two here. A leads B if and only if A can direct, the second case here, the actions and behavior and or thoughts of everyone involved in a group B or activity B. So then here you get both leading single people and leading groups. Now, the thing that you should do when you see this is, can you think of any counterexamples? So counterexamples would be to show that somebody is being directed but is not being led, or somebody is led and it doesn't fit this definition. So the, the two weaknesses of a definition can always be, is it too narrow or is it too wide? If you can't find any counterexamples, then you can tentatively accept the definition. If you find counterexamples, we try to make a new definition which is better. Yeah? I was thinking forcing people in some way, new direct actions. Yeah. Uh, this could be either by, um, uh, well, I mean, through the threat of violence or you know, economic politic, yes. uh, political tools and so on. Yes. Uh, I was thinking, for example, of uh, the structural adaptation programs that the IMS usually imposes in certain countries in order to give first loans. Yes. Things like that. I mean, that's uh, pretty much um, well controlling or directing their behavior, yes. at least regarding economics, economic policy. Yeah, I agree, but it's not a counterexample. Well, it fits this definition. I'm not sure. I mean, they are leading those countries. Well, are they really? I mean, yeah. I mean, you maybe you know. It's possible here that we should get into strong leading and weak leading, and maybe we should even find different words for those things. Yeah, you so, like with soft power or hard yeah, power. Yeah, soft power, hard mm -hmm. power. Yeah, that, that's probably what we should get into. But I think it's leadership in a wide sense in both cases. Well, I mean, we have we have the um, we have the definition of leadership from Cal uh, regarding values and so on and setting long-term goals. Uh, wouldn't you say, I mean, that I mean, the people being led in in, in my case with the structural education programs, they might not always agree with the goals. I mean, usually what? Can you be led without agreeing with being led? That, that, that's, that's a good question. I yes, mean, I agree. Right. <laughs> do you have to have a certain amount of motivation uh, as... No, as but not motivation, but maybe acceptance? <clears throat> yes, a motivation no, acceptance. Now, so if I tell you, okay, I'm going to lead you now. I'd like you to go dancing tomorrow night. And you say, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go dancing tomorrow night. Yes. Am I leading you? No, 
I don't think so. It's, it, it's a totally failed attempt, at least. <laughs> I mean, you can say that I'm attempting to lead you, but I'm not really leading you. Well, but then I might actually go and dance tomorrow. But still, you might, but then I haven't. They haven't leading you. But then I do something grudgingly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you wanted to say something? Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking, like, these definitions only uh, address, like, the possibility of directing. Like, a leads B if A can direct B. But wouldn't it be simple to just say A leads B if A directs B? Like, skip the, the can? Yeah, you're I... right. That's, it's making uh, this... Uh, with your notion, it's more actual. This yeah. is more potential, in a sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I'll think about that. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. So it has the ability to. It doesn't mean that the person is actually exercising leadership at that point. But he could, or she could. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good, correct point, Chris. Yeah? Okay. So now we talked about the definition. You can think about if you have another one. Uh, okay, so the semantic role table that we had on the PowerPoint slide before, is this, right? So we have the agent, we have reason, motive, we have goal, purpose, function. Well, those I put those words, when I put several words in one uh, little square here, it's because they're not, it's not so easy to differentiate them. I mean, they, they can be differentiated if you want to work more <coughs> specifically on this. But they are, they are related to a great extent. So, the reasons or motives for doing something are, are very similar. Having a goal, having a purpose, the function of something, all those three are similar. Sometimes function is more subconscious and goals and purposes are more conscious, more aware. Uh, then here's a surprise maybe for you. Patient. Uh, this is, has to do with old-fashioned uh, terminology where you would talk about agent and patient. So if Bill kisses <coughs> Betty, then Betty is the patient. This has to do with the person who is more passive, so to speak, and the agent is the person who is more active. Okay, so it's an old, yeah, it comes from that terminology. It's a gr grammatical terminology in, in its origin. Instrument, well, that's what you're using in order to Pursue your leadership. Resource, well, those are the means or background stuff that you have at your disposal to exercise your leadership. You do it in a particular environment and context, and again, those two words are closely related, environment and context. Time, duration, duration is how long the time lasts. Place, manner, yeah, manner and style, as we'll see, they are hard to distinguish. But in one of your textbooks, you'll see that there's some person there who knows how to distinguish them. I'm not sure they do, but they think they do. They are hard to distinguish. Um, and then result. Yeah. So these are, there are actually other roles you one can think of, but they seem to be um, fairly yeah, relevant for discussing leadership. Okay, another thing we have to decide on is are we going to study uh, leadership descriptively or normatively? Are we going to be interested in uh, what leadership really is? Or are we going to be interested in what leadership should be? So we might see that the leaders, some leaders, in order to uh, pursue their leadership for example, think that it is a good idea to lie. To tell the public all sorts of lies, to tell other people lies, and in that way you can sort of go ahead and you are not thrown out of your leading role. And that's what happens descriptively. But we might, of course, then ask, is this what should happen? Should leaders be allowed to lie? How many people think that le leaders should lie? One, two, 
There are at least 10. Okay, how many people should think that they should not lie? About the same amount. Okay, well, you know, there has been a sort of debate on this in political science. And uh, there is a very famous person called Machiavelli. Have you heard about Machiavelli? Yes. <laughs> who, who definitely advocates that leaders should not only lie, but they should do many other what we would call maybe unethical things. Uh, but other people think that that's not so good. Maybe they should try to be more honest and forthright and so on. And this is an ongoing debate. So anyway, it's an it's a illustration of the contrast between a more descriptive approach to what happens and a more normative approach where you discover what should happen. And uh, there's no general agreement about any of the two, actually. People disagree on what really happens and people disagree on what should happen. <clears throat> now, the methods we can have to study leadership, there are many methods, but here are some. We can directly observe what leaders do, so we could follow, if we are allowed, some, you know, leaders like to be secret sometimes, they just surround themselves with secret police and various things, so it's not so easy always to actually observe them. But uh, to the extent that we are able to do that, we, we could try that, direct observation. We could make audio and video recordings of what they're doing. That's also not so easy always. We, we just try to hide what they're doing. So. Uh, written documents that uh, are written by leaders. You can examine them, read them, analyze them. And uh, then we can, of course, also ask people about what they think is happening, what the leaders are doing, or what they think should be happening. So when you do uh, value studies, and there have been many studies made of yeah, values connected with leadership, how should, what should a good leader be like? Then, then you're asking people what they think. Uh, that leaders should be like if they're good. And so there you can use interviews, questionnaires. Actually, in some cases, you might even try experiments to study leaders. Who can think of an experiment? How can you use an experiment to study leadership? Yeah? Uh, give him different kinds of uh, groups. Yes. Mm -hmm. And ask, them, ask that person to lead those groups? Yeah, lead in some kind of direction. You are um, you give them a task, fulfill this task with this kind of different groups. Okay, so you have three different groups, mm -hmm. and they're slightly different. We, maybe we even instruct them to be different. Yeah. We could say, you know, one group be uncooperative, mm -hmm. another group be cooperative. Mm -hmm. And we pick one person, we say, go in, lead that group, get them to, I don't know, do something, go to the movies, or go to dancing, or something. Okay, and then we see how that person manages with an uncooperative group and how he manages with a, with a cooperative group. And that would be an experimental approach to leadership. And it would, you, know, you could study the means that people, in this case probably would be naive, or it doesn't have to be, but it could be naive people who haven't given it so much thought. What, what strategies do we come up with spontaneously when we have to lead people? You could do that study for a master's thesis here. <laughs> that would be interesting. Be more on the next. I mean, there are many other experimental possibilities, but this is just one, one possibility. <clears throat> okay, and but we also we should never forget that we can sit down and just think. I mean, a lot of the stuff that people have written about leadership, for example, Machiavelli, to mention that person again, probably just happened, he just sat down after a life in the service of various Italian princes, and he sat down and he thought about how things should be done in order to be efficient from his point of view. So just theoretical reflection is always well, it's a, it's a good ingredient of anything. And some of the people who write on this, that's all they do. Okay. So, let's go back a little to the semantic role analysis. And uh, before we do that, let me just say that 
semantic role analysis could be used both in descriptive and normative studies. So you need to know what roles you're talking about. Are you talking about the leaders, the agents? Are you talking about those who are led, the followers or the patients? Or are you talking about the instruments? In both, both if you're interested in what actually happens and what should be happening, these are the terms you will be using. These are the concepts that you will be uh, considering. So, to structure what is described and explained both factually and normatively, semantic role analysis can be useful. So this will lead us to our first little task for you. Now, you have, you, we have worked this way before, so talk to your neighbors. And if you're uh, sitting far away from your neighbor, you have to... And you can turn around. Okay? And so the task, this first task is pretty easy. Try to think of types of leaders and led. So, types of people who lead and types of people who agree to be led. So we have some examples of types of leaders. Yeah. Pirates. 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 And your second attempt is on the characteristic of the leaders. Yes. So both are possible. We'll yes. Come to that. We'll come to that. <laughs> yes. Both are relevant. That's true. I mean, there are many taxonomies of leadership. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, we were discussing a little bit. Are there any leaders without power? Uh, what would be a, an example of a leader without power? Yeah, we couldn't come up with that. <laughs> If you follow my definition, there should not be really. Because yeah. we're, we're saying that you should have the ability or you should actually direct people. That means you have power. So, uh, I don't know. If you can come up with a plausible example about somebody without power who is a leader, I, I will, you know, I want to hear it first. Yeah, you have one. British Queen. She has no real power. So, yeah. right. Now you smuggled in the word real. Well, she doesn't have any, actually. I think she does. A lot of British people listen to the Queen with great respect and they respect and they try to... She has a lot more to say than other people. Yeah? Yeah, so I'm thinking, what if the leader is dead? Yeah. Is that the same? North of Korea, they, they still, you know, revere and still kneel and still follow the thing. Is it Kim Il-sung? Yes, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Okay, that, um, that's, I, mean, I agree. If they do follow their values, but they are dead. Yes. Uh, how about Alexander the Great? Does he? Well, he probably. Let's take someone else. Let's take, um, I don't know, Nero, Caligula, and some of the Roman emperors. I, I'm not sure that anybody really <laughs> respects them anymore, and they don't have that much power anymore. Nero, so, like Karl Marx, just 
Steal, uh, whose ideas steal. Yeah, I know, but they're, they're easier to use. They still, but I'm it's trying to poison. take somebody who does not really have it in power today. Mm -hmm. Would we not still call them a leader, and why would we? That's, I mean, you know, Nero and Caligula are better counterexamples because they really don't have any power today, probably. But they had to, they had once upon a time. So probably we have to make a definition so that it's anchored in some time and space points. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't normally, you know, it doesn't have to be in our time. Uh, Nero was a leader, I don't know when he lived, the first hundred years after Christ, right? Yeah. But he's not a leader today. But Karl Marx, in some weak sounds, is a leader, not so weak sounds. Some people are still following Karl Marx, yes. So, okay, so we, we would have to say leader at a certain time and place. And that doesn't mean you're always a leader everywhere. That's probably the way to get out of it. Okay, let's have a look at the list I had. It's not so different from yours. So here we have emperor, empress, king, queen, chief, prime minister, pope, president, dictator, tyrant. You see that some of these words are a bit evaluative. You know, negative evaluation. So probably we'll find leadership words or leader words where some of them are sort of positive in nature and some of them are more ne negative. Boss, chief, CEO, um, general, mayor, governor, chairperson, mentor, tutor. So here we're coming down to maybe weaker types of leadership, but still some sort of leadership. Yeah? No, they should have been. They should have been. I, I, this, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just examples. Okay, so you can see that there are many kinds of leaders. Now, what about those who are being led? Do we have special words for those too? Students. Yeah. Citizens. 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 Citizen. 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 Yes. Yes. <laughs> Citizen. Yes. Citizen. Children. Yeah. Employers. Em Employees. Em Sorry. Employees. <laughs> yes. 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 <coughs> yeah. Yeah. These are all, I think, good words for those who are being led. And there are several other words. Let's have a look. What I had in mind here. Okay, so here we have the children in the family. So you can also lead organizations, not just people. You can lead organizations. You can lead a nation. You can lead an ideological movement, like here's Karl Marx, or uh, Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini. He led a sort of movement of Shia, Muslim, Muslim Islam. Leading an industrial company, leading a university, leading a church, leading a rock band, leading a street gang, leading a virtual team or a work group. So, very big variety. Now, here we had, uh, you mentioned this thing about uh, jumping up and down, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, that's getting to the leading of activities. So, that, that's uh, leading a meeting. Leading a sing song, we all sing something together. Uh, leading football training, debate, discussion, expedition, business. Okay, so these are all examples of leadership, and they are slightly different. You can lead groups, you can lead organizations, you can lead activities. And with all of these, we can ask both the descriptive question and the normative question. What actually happens when the leadership is exercised? What should happen? And I guess a lot of people who want consultants, they want, to, they want you to tell them what they should do with their leaders. Let's say you became a consultant to a company and the CEO calls you in and says, you know, what should I do to lead this company? It <laughs> should. He's not going to say, what am I doing? Or well, maybe he will ask. Or if he says, what should I do? You should say, Let's first look at what you are doing, and then we'll see, can we make any changes? And that's, that's you know, the nature of consulting. Okay, so there is both the descriptive question and the normative question.
Okay, let's try if we can give you another question before we take a break here. What are some of the manners and styles of leadership? So talk to your neighbors and try to figure out manners and styles. Okay? Uh, it's difficult to know the difference between manner and style. Actually, I must say I'm a bit, uh, I'm not sure, I haven't uh, sat down and thought long enough about this to be able to tell you exactly what the difference is. So, don't worry too much about that, I would say. Okay, can you have some, do you have some examples? Any? Uh, we'll be thinking about this traditional uh, classification that it could be authoritative yeah. or democratic or liberal. Yes. And then it could also be given. And then we uh, came out with a question to you. <laughs> okay, so that, but before you come to the question to me, you, yeah. you had you had uh, democratic authoritarian, and you call it liberal. Yeah. Often it's called laissez faire. It's not, you know, that means you don't. Okay, you haven't heard this term. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it means that you don't interfere that much. Yeah. You you let people do what they like, more or less. Um, liberal perhaps would not be as uh, easygoing. <laughs> liberal would probably be a little more structured, but. But uh, less affair is the idea is that you don't do it. And then you have hidden covert. Yeah, that's right. Some people exercise their leadership in a hidden way. And other people are more overt and transparent. But that, those are two different kind of dimensions uh, that you could classify man or with. Yeah. The question to me is? Yeah, we've been thinking first about if it could be constructive and destructive leadership. And then we thought, if leadership could ever be destructive or according, because we were thinking of an example, if someone's uh, um, leadership is harmful for the organization, is destroying the organization, then in a way it's destructive. Yes. But if we are thinking, if someone's goal was to destroy the organization, according to this goal, the leadership was constructive. So if leadership, <laughs> if leadership could be destructive, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of, so you were constructing a kind of logical paradox. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Uh, but, okay, before we get to the paradox, let me just point one thing out. It might be useful to uh, distinguish between short-term and long-term. So, if you took, uh, let's say, Adolf Hitler, okay, if you had looked at him around, let's say, 1938, maybe a lot of people would have said, there's a great leader, he's very constructive for Germany. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if we look at it in, in nine, nine, ten years later, 1948, probably, probably a lot of people say his leadership was destructive. It led to you know, a very bad state of affairs for Germany. Uh, so, yeah, so long term, short term is probably, you know, short term destructive, long term destructive. Okay, and the other, now, the, the, uh, then you have your paradox. If the leader actually has as his goal to destroy the organization right from the beginning, Shouldn't we take his goal into account and call his successful destruction constructive? <laughs> yeah, it's a, you can think about it yourselves. It's a nice, uh, nice example. <laughs> yeah. And if you, for example, part of the Kennedy or Schreiber family, then you probably have a certain feeling of leadership that is inherent. Yes. And if you compare it maybe with Gandhi, he might have like another approach and also another manner of leadership because he worked with very up yeah. leadership. So, so your first distinction is between inherited and uh, let's say earned or ascribed, mm -hmm. where, you, where you actually had to do a lot of work yourself, you were not like kings and queens are usually, they just, you know, they inherit the, the leadership position. Yeah, but I think that's not, uh, because most of the kings, like at least in Europe, they are not having any, like, of course they have, they are like spiritual leaders or maybe like good examples for the society, but they are not like good. <laughs> but they have had. They have had in the yeah, past, and that's why I've And, and the distinction is still, I mean, if you take leaders of big industrial companies, uh, very often there are these going families. They inherit from one to another. So, like Kennedy or whatever. Yeah, the Kennedy clan to some extent, I agree. 
So inherited leadership, yes, is definitely a category, whereas the other one, I don't know the best word for it, ascribed or earned or, yeah, where you have to do some work yourself to get the leadership role. I think it's a good distinction. And would you have one more thing to say? Was that, that, was, that was the main thing, yeah? Yeah, you have something? No, you just put in your hair? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Let me, I'll show you what I have. <laughs> So that's the one you have, right? Authoritarian, that's, a, that's a, what you find in most textbooks. And here is another one you find in a lot of textbooks. Uh, this is sometimes called man, and this sometimes called style. I'm not sure I can defend the way it's divided. Um, so, uh, style, charismatic, you have your, all heard this word? That's from uh, Max Weber and his ideas about some kinds of leadership. Um, bureaucratic, that's where you follow rules and you, you're, you, know, you don't step outside of the rules and regulations, you're very rule fixated, you can never do, you know, charismatic leaders don't worry too much about rules, they can go out and they can talk to the janitors, etc. But if you're, a, if you're a bureaucratic type, then you're going to follow the straight, straight line of command and you don't, okay, so that's the hierar hierarchical bureaucratic type. And then you have the egalitarian. They try to more spread out power to everyone and treat everyone as an equal. That's not the same as charismatic. Charismatic people can also talk to everyone, but they are still the central point. They are the people who sort of run the show. Okay, so these, these are uh, the kind of characterizations you'll find in your textbooks. And here I got this out of um, one of your textbooks. So here we have these three, democratic, authoritarian, less fair. And here are the uh, characteristics that uh, the author of the book gives you. Democratic policy goals together with followers. If you're authoritarian, the leader's policy goals. Less fair. You don't have any goals, you take the participant's policy goals. Democratic, you have two-way communication and interaction. Authoritarian, it's one-way communication, downward, you control people. Less affair, you're non-committed, you avoid interaction, you'd rather be on your own than you let people take care of themselves. Uh, democratic, you have discussion. Authoritarian, a lot less discussion. Less affair, you avoid discussion. Democratic, you give suggestions and alternatives. Authoritarians, you give directives. Less affair, you perhaps give suggestions, and when asked, you might give an alternative, but you're basically not very active. Democratic, uh, give positive feedback, and you don't use punishment so much. Authoritarian, you give positive feedback when people are obedient, and you punish mistakes. Less affair, you avoid both rewards and punishments. You try, try to involve being, you know, you don't want to be involved too much. Uh, democratic, you listen. Authoritarian, you listen less. Less affair, you also listen less. Democratic, you mediate conflicts. Authoritarian, you try to use conflicts. Divide et impera, common trick. Romans used it a lot. And less affair, you just avoid. You're trying to get away. Yes? Can you give an example of the less affair uh, of that leader that uses this method? Yeah. Let me turn it to you. Can anybody give a, an example of a less affair leader? And even harder, can you give an example of when it would be a good thing to be a less affair leader? You can. If you're living in a hippie community where yeah. a lot of adults have like maybe an interesting idea of family and family constructions and they try to live in a community with as little rules as possible where the individual tries to evolve to a very high extent or kind of personality or whatever. That could be if they still have like one person that is kind of doing some administrative work or like trying to keep the whole plan together, then this could be a way of showing this fair yeah. Basically, when you have a lot of independent, competent individuals who are self-governed, 
and who don't really want too much directorship, that's when a laissez-faire leader would be a good thing. I mean, there are some cases of that. So your case is possibly a case, the hippie family. <coughs> I had it. Mine. Yeah, you had Yeah, and uh, I was <laughs> thinking about this um, marketing agents, yeah. like, uh, where they uh, stress the importance of creativity. Yeah. They also often work with less affair leadership. Yes. For open up for the creativity within the group. Yeah, and I, the example I had is actually one which is sometimes occurs in universities. That's where you have a group of experts who are trying to do something together. I mean, they intensely dislike if you have a leader who tries to tell them what to do. <laughs> they, 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 they are most happy when they get a kind of less affair leader, who lets them develop their own theories and interact the way they want to themselves. And the, the most successful leaders probably in those circumstances are the less affair leaders. So, yeah, what we learn from this is actually these three types of leadership have their uses. Can anybody think of a positive case of authoritarian leadership? In the war? In the war, yes, exactly. It's a very difficult problem to fight the war if you don't have some line of command and get people to, because they're risking their lives and you need to have them at, at certain positions doing things, otherwise it's, it's hard. Yeah, any, any other, yeah? Maybe Kinds of chaotic situations. Chaotic situations, yes, where there's great danger. If people don't act very quickly in a certain direction, they might, you know, if you're going to stop and discuss, then you will lose your lives. So you cannot really, yeah? Operations. Operations, yes, if the nurses start to discuss with the. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Okay, yeah? Uh, on films, sets, yeah. and TV sets. On yeah. film and TV sets. When you produce something, it yeah, to be the director of the movie, yeah, yeah, maybe, uh, that, yeah, maybe it's so. If they start to argue, with him, maybe it's not so good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the general point that we can learn from this is actually none of the three is, is um, you know, something you can always use. They all have their uses in more or less limited contexts. And, you know, and in the textbooks, maybe they will try to tell you, I'm not sure, that this one is always good, democratic, it sounds great. But I'm not so sure. I mean, they all have their uses. Yeah? I think I have, have a very interesting question. That how do you think the lesson fair leadership can reach a common goal? How they can reach a common goal? Yeah. Uh, Participants' policy goals. If we all have the same goal, let's say we're scientists, we want, want to find out how whatever problem we're investigating, how it really, the truth, how it really works. So we have similar goals. We don't really need to, then we all have that goal, right? So we can work together without having to explicitly speak about it. So already. Yeah, exactly. And they're similar enough to enable weak leadership because the people who are in the organization are all strong and autonomous and going in the same direction. So that, that's, I agree, maybe less affair is the hardest to find cases where it, it's a good thing, but, but it is possible to find those cases. Yeah? Oh, what it is called in English, but uh, economist of the Yeah. They sometimes are like that. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes they're also more democratic. How would you translate it in, into English? Because it's not a. It's not, as far as I know, an English uh, commercial legal term. Yeah, I know it is. But I don't know what it is in English actually. Well, if you have a like cooperation between different kind of people that. Uh, Grow uh, plants, for instance. Yes. They go together and they sell them together. Yeah, that could be a cooperative society. Yeah, cooperative society. But it yeah. maybe not. It's, Swedish economic feeling is a very special. It's yeah. a legal, special kind of entity. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't know what it is in <laughs> English or, or British or American legal terms. Anyway, I think we've come to the time for a little break. So ten minutes break. Yeah. Good for routine, simple tasks. Uh, 
uh, when the leader is more competent than the followers. Yeah, that maybe we didn't mention that. But of course, when when the leader really knows a lot more than the followers, it might be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Still fighting this research still fighting the authorian style, or is it in questioning it in general? Because you could maybe even um, argument saying if you are like a really good democratic leader and you manage to lead your team in a trustful way that they know that they can um, uh, trust each other and they can trust you then in this case it's like even in an emergency situation or even in a military operation or during a fire or whatever you don't necessarily need any authoritarian leadership but because the team works so well they will manage without like strict orders anyway yeah. I would say that for example you, there, you, you don't always have to find group sometimes groups emerge Oh, well, for this specific situation, so you cannot be saying, like, these people trust each other. No, no, but she's saying if they do. If, if trust is so high that you can more or less tell people what to do and they don't question you, uh, then it becomes very similar to a <laughs> And, you know, you sort of get the same actions that you would get in an authoritarian uh, organization, but the reason is different. It's a very high level of trust. Maybe. Maybe it's possible. I don't know. You we have to find some military organization which is organized the way you say. Maybe there is. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem uh, it doesn't seem logically impossible, but maybe empirically difficult to achieve. Okay. When the followers are very many, that's another case where you know you cannot. I mean, very many. There are chances that people will not agree and will want to argue against you will increase. And uh, maybe in some cases that's not possible. And lack of time, urgency. Uh, we mentioned that before. Democratic, when participation and involvement is needed, and you need creativity and commitment. And democratic works. Less affair, when followers are independent, motivated, and knowledgeable. So here is another thing we didn't say before. If you are a very competent leader, you should actually be able maybe to use all three styles, depending on circumstances. So maybe you can see now. Now it's more or less a fair. What what is uh, you know these people are all autonomous, working in the right way. Maybe we don't need so much leadership here. Or this is a very large crowd and there is a very big danger that they might do completely strange things and maybe we have to be a little more authoritarian now. So that, that's the in general idea that these can be motivated in different situations and maybe even single people can learn to use some of them depending on circumstances. Uh, can these, uh, if these three slides are combined together? Can it produce a new style of leadership and what would you call that? <laughs> Combination style. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they are not... Uh, in reality, they are often combined, right? So if you go to a scientific group who is uh, working maybe more or less under a less fair kind of leadership, then suddenly there's one person in the group who tur turns out to be a very strong professor and starts to you know, tell the others what to do, it could happen. Or another time you get a person who is, uh, you know, likes a kind of democratic organization, he wants a more, little more rules and starts to, but he wants to do it in a democratic way. I mean, it happens all the time. So these, these three forms of organization are not uh, totally uh, separate from each other. They can glide into each other and they can start to, uh, you know, you can get mixtures. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, could the leader should uh, use the style depending on the follower in the same uh, in the same situation? Can can what? Uh, the uh, the leader use the style depending on the follower in the same situation. I mean, uh, maybe someone is like prefer to give a uh, good him. Oh, you mean in the same situation yes. you have different kinds of followers. Yeah. Some of them need less affair, some of them need authoritarian, some of them need democratic. That would be a skillful leader. 
somehow you would have to uh, get the other, you know, the groups that are not getting that treatment to accept that they're not getting the same treatment. But if you can imagine, if you can do that, it's probably not so easy, but maybe, yeah. Could be done. <coughs> okay, here are, oh, well, I should show you, I'll ask you first. What manners, what manners and styles do we have of followers? Yeah, followers can be cooperative and not cooperative. What else can we say about followers? Knowledgeable or, or ignorant? I, I wouldn't say ignorant, but uh, have a list of competency. competency. Yeah. So they can be more or less all of yeah. Yes, yes. Can conscious and unconscious? Yeah, maybe. Unconscious and conscious uh, followers of a certain ideology or yes, it could happen. We, we, uh, yeah. we take in a lot of things that we're not aware of and we start to behave in a certain way without really understanding that what we're doing happens, yes. Anything else? Yeah. People who follow without questioning. Um, yeah, they can be uh, very obedient. Yeah. Or they can be less obedient to questioning and crit critical and so on. Yes. Yes. I, I sort of uh, have three suggestions. Yeah. Uh, depending on commitment, uh, what part? The fanatic as a commitment to leader, cause, or vision. Yeah. Uh, pragmatic as a commitment to the result. And the participatory as a commitment to the process. Yeah, that's similar to what we get in the textbook. <laughs> you got it past the textbook, right? <laughs> I, no, I, I just wrote it. Independent discovery. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Could yeah. Short term. What? Short term. Short term, long term follower, yes. You know, you, you stay loyal for a long, all your life, or you're just, uh, right now it suits my purposes to follow this. Okay, so it's also a kind of strategic follower at some point. Yeah? Yeah, those are all possible. Let's have a look at what I have in mind. So here we have alienated. Those are people who... Uh, they're like the lesser fair leaders. They're like the, you know, they they want to have as little contact as possible. They just sort of pay lip service. And they, if you go around the university, you'll find people like that. They don't like the present leadership at all, and they they are sort of looking like they're doing what they're supposed to, but they might not really do it. So you find this in all, you know, all organizations. They don't really like the goals, etc. So they they're just there. And they do as little as possible. And then we have the totally committed conformists who never oppose the leadership at all, but always do exactly what they're told. I'm calling them yes men and yes women. They're passive. They always go along with what is being asked of them. Then we have the pragmatists. They are more moderately committed to the goals and maybe more autonomous in what they're doing. And then we have the exemplary followers, committed and independent. <laughs> yeah. So those those are the ones we really want, right? They they have the same goals and they are on their own taking initiatives in that direction. <coughs> but like the leadership styles, all follower styles can have advantages in different situations. It's not clear that it's always bad to be alienated. It's not clear that it's always bad to be a conformist, etc. You know, depends on what kind of organization it, it is. What are the circumstances? Maybe you have no other choice. But again, probably in the textbook you will find that people, they want democratic leaders and they want exemplary followers. So from a normative point of view, that's probably what's going to be advocated. Democratic leadership and exemplary following. Okay, now we want to go on.
to another semantic role, namely reasons, motives, purposes, and goals. So I'm going to give you the task again to think of some reasons, motives, purposes, and goals for leadership. Let's start to your neighbor. Is it possible to divide reasons, motives from purposes and goals? You can start with reasons and motives. So reasons and motives sort of are there in the beginning. They're back. They were, that are pushing you towards leadership. Purposes and goals maybe we can think of as what you want to achieve by being a leader. Yeah? And the reason could be that people try to make sense of their surrounding and the environment around them and this uh, leads to insecurities and in order to fight those insecurities, leadership is this is a reason for leadership. Certain people take responsibilities and try to influence the rest around. And motive could maybe, maybe be the desire for power. So you want to control your environment so no unpleasant surprises are going to hit you. Yeah, in a very extreme sense, yes. Yeah. That sounds like Hofstede is uncertainty avoidance. <laughs> yes. But that would be a reason why people have leadership or why people need yeah. and why people No, no, I don't deny that and you could absolutely be right. Yes. That could be a sort of deep psychoanalytic reason driving people towards leadership. Yeah, and motives could be like the desire for power or the desire to fight this insecurity. Yeah, but the desire for power could be linked to this, right? That's the desire for control of... But it could also be have other sources. I agree, but, but it could be linked. Yeah, good. Anything else? Yeah? To prevent personal reasons of leader as a self-realization. Self-realization. Self-actualization. You, yeah, you see that I can really only be realized as a full person by being the leader. Yes, why not? Possible? Some people, yeah? We had a discussion also about that. But isn't that always the reason and motives about to being a leader? To be self-confirmative and the people recognize yourself? Well, some people think that they can only, you know, actualize their full self by being a leader, I guess. Could be. Other people think it's not necessary to be a leader, too. I, I, would, I would just want to say, it's not so that the doctor, he's a leader in a sense when he's a specialist, but it's not like he wants it. So maybe in that it could be that the leadership was the most important, but uh, but mostly it's probably not. They have another thing, and then leadership follows with that. Yeah. Maybe there can be alt altruistic reasons or motives because they think that uh, if if I do, if I cannot unify this nation, nobody else can. Or something. Could be. I'm the only one who can do this historic mission at this time. I have to sacrifice myself. At least that's what they want people to write about them, right? <laughs> Maybe in a few cases it could actually be true. <laughs> I say a few cases. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Both followers and leaders sometimes need to be organized and for achieving some more organizations. They need to be organized? Yeah, they need to have some uh, strict organization. Why is that a reason or motive? Because to achieve some goal, sometimes... They yeah, but that sounds more like an instrument for how you get to be a leader. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Uh, so here we have some reasons, ambition, inherited power, motives, lust for power, wish to become rich, famous, I, so I'm, I have much more negative here than some of you had of you. <laughs> the idealistic reasons are missing here. Uh, and the uh, psychoanalytic uh, is also missing here. But, but all of them are, are possible, I agree. <clears throat> Now let's have a look at the purposes and goals. So we already actually came into that. If you're an idealist and you want to sacrifice yourself for the nation or something, that, that's a purpose or goal. Actually, it's not always so easy to keep purpose and goal separate from reason or motive. Uh, and um, we'll see what I had in mind here. So purposes and goals, realize a vision of some sort. You might have that. You know, the big political leaders usually claim that they had a vision that they wanted to, to realize. Sometimes they get that 
vision after they have become leaders, but uh, they often want to say that they had it and then they became a leader in order to realize the vision. Um, yeah. Convince followers, gain or maintain or increase power. That, that's always a basic ingredient of any leadership. To enjoy power in some sense, to, to feel a need to have power to, to control other people. Maybe because you're very insecure yourself, or maybe for some other reason. Yeah? But there are also cases of uh, like unwilling leaders. And Those, now we get to the idealist again. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is not, not necessarily about, you know, having or, like, increasing yeah. power. You know, yeah. You're just the only person who... Like, say that you, are, you have a lot of friends who visit your hometown. You're the only person who knows the town, and then you have to lead them through yes. town, but maybe you're not, you don't want to be a leader. No, that's true. When, when it comes to everyday life, smaller tasks, I think they are more common. That kind of leadership is much more common, I agree. But when it comes to political leadership, I'm a little more doubtful, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, in the uh, textbook, you find two purpose-related dimensions of leadership which are discussed, and they are actually quite interesting. And they are the difference between orientation to task and purpose. If you take a, it could be a political leader or it could be an industrial company. And the other orientation is to relationship with followers. So in the first case here, you are, yeah, you're trying to achieve whatever the organization is supposed to achieve. And you see that as the most important thing. In the second case, you see your relationship to the people in the group or organization that you're leading as the most important thing. And perhaps the actual goals of the organization become less important. I have a table on that. So if you have task orientation, you uh, disseminate information. But if you have a more interpersonal orientation, you solicit opinions <coughs> from people. You have a task orientation, you focus more on facts, data, and information related to the task, and you're less interested in the feelings of the people you're leading. If you have an interpersonal orientation, you focus on feelings and attitudes related to personal needs of these people. If you have a task orientation, you're often focused on productivity through technical skills, but in the personal orientation, you are more using personal skills, trying to be nice to people, get them positively motivated, etc. Task orientation, you make demands of people. Personal orientation, you make requests. Uh, task orientation, you perhaps don't feel you have time to talk to everyone, so you give uh, instructions, etc. in writing, but if you have a personal orientation, that's not so good, so you want to have more face-to-face -face communication. You can see that the way these two orientations have been played out here largely come from, let's say, an American, American business company setting. I mean, if you had been thinking of another example, maybe the, the words wouldn't have been worded exactly like this. So I, I took this again out of one of your textbooks and summarized it. But I think there's something to this. If you go around modern organizations today, you can clearly see that some people are more focused on, if you go to the university, we should produce research, we should you know, do this and this. That's what some people say. Then you have other people, they don't worry too much, they just see to it that they have good relations with everybody and they don't care so much if we have a lot of publications. If you go to an industrial company, you would be looking at the figures, the income. Are we making profits? Are we making enough profits? That's the big thing. And, you know, the feelings of people who are working there, whether they feel good, whether there's a good social environment, is not so important. And some people have tried to say that if you focus on the interpersonal level, you will automatically get a better task orientation. But unfortunately, that does not seem to be true. 
And you know, it would be the best of worlds if it were true. But it really isn't always true. People can spend too much time being nice to each other and drinking coffee and then the company is going this way. So that's, you know, that's one of the big challenges that you meet as a leadership. How do you balance these two needs? Obviously you need both. And it's the, the trick is to find a way to uh, combine them in, a, in an optimal way. <laughs> okay. Now I want you to uh, start to think about something else. Who becomes a leader? So, I want you to reflect on these two questions. What behaviors lead to not becoming a leader of a group? What are negative behaviors for group leadership? And what behaviors are positive if you want to become a leader of the group? What are positive behaviors for group leadership? So maybe some of you would like to lead your friends. What should you do? Or maybe some of you would not like to lead your friends. What should you not? What should you do then? Discuss with your friends. Okay, let's start with uh, behaviors that you should uh, exhibit if you don't want to be the leader. What should you do if you don't want to be the leader? Keep quiet. Be quiet. Yes, don't participate. Yes. Be undecisive. Undecisive, yes. What else? Huh? Unorganized. Unorganized. Ignorant. Ignorant, yes. Pessimist. Pessimist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think those are all possible things. There might be a few more. You'll see my list later. What about if you want to be a leader? What should you do? Initiative. Initiative? So you should flatter people? It doesn't mean flatter people, but at least be able to talk to them. You should talk to them, yeah. Not everyone. Yeah. Diplomatic skills. You should be a diplomat, so you don't want to talk to the leaders. No, it doesn't mean, uh, by diplomatic I mean know when to lie, maybe when not to say enough truth, but, you know, manage. This yeah, so you... If you say too much of truth, maybe no one will follow you. Right. So you have to be, uh, yeah, I understand, social skills as they say, social competence is a word that's sometimes used, yes? Yes? The question is a little bit uh, shaky on that ground, I guess, because it says what behaviors lead not to becoming a leader of a group? We said, for example, pessimism, but you can uh, gather people around you with your pessimism. Yes, you're right. So pessimism is perhaps not the strongest thing. No, but uh, even the the other attributes, the, the other characteristics that we have been talking about, you can still use them to. I don't know to about not participating. Um, what, what, what How can you become a leader if you're you're, if you're absolutely not participating, silently looking down? I, it's, it's very hard. Okay, to not, not, you, not all of them, but some of them. Yeah, some Maybe. of them. Some of them I do. Some yeah. Of them, yeah. The, uh, for that past being passive, maybe you are sitting passive in the corner while all the group is, you know, arguing and they like saying, okay, this was a style, we should choose him as a leader. No, well, if you then stay out of it, even at that point, no, because then you have choose. to change your behavior and take over. You don't really have to. If that it is actually the active choice that makes you, that uh, that leads you to not becoming a leader of a group, not your in participatory behavior. What do you mean? It could be an active choice. You don't want to be the leader. So exactly, yeah. That, that, but that's the active choice of yeah. not becoming the leader of that group. What makes you, what leads you not becoming the leader of that group. Not necessarily yeah. uh, not participating in that group at that point. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I, <laughs> okay, let's look at the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. So here, anyway, I think don't participate is a good way to stay out of being a leader. Take subservient tasks. So do things which don't, you know, which mean that you have to ask other people for how to do it all the time. Show obedience. And here is one, which is the opposite of social competence of the thing. Be categorical and uncompromising. Very few groups today will choose such people as leaders. 
Maybe in the old days they would choose them, but now it's more uncommon. If you like strong personalities, you might choose a person like that, but it's nowadays this social skills stuff seems to be high on the list. Okay, if you want to be a leader, participate, set goals, give directions, summarize, manage conflicts, show competence, and help to foster group cohesion in various ways. We'll do this together, etc., etc. So here again is a possible experiment that you could do. Now this, this, is, this is obvious for an experimental approach. Have two groups and uh, look at how they select their leaders. What do the people do who become the leaders? What do the people do who are not the leaders? And ask them to have a leader by the end of the session. That, I mean, there are different ways in which you could formulate this, but it shows you again where here is a place where an experimental approach might be possible. Somebody had their hand up over there? Yeah? When, when it comes to negative and positive behavior leaders, isn't it important to look at the uh, goals of the leadership and then the environment, if it's formal or informal? Because leader among friends, he will have one kind of uh, strategy. strategy. And he might be maybe just be friendly or something and became a leader. That's true. When it will not work in an organization. Yeah. This is again somewhat inspired by your textbook, I think. And uh, here we're talking about the American business organizational setting, I think. But I agree with you. I mean, there are different settings, and it might be that different strategies are the best in, in different kinds of uh, settings. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, time is uh, moving fast, so I don't think I'll give you too much time to think about this one. What are the instruments and resources of leadership? And what are the environments, times and places? Let's go on to see what I thought myself about this. <laughs> uh, so, instruments of leadership, communication and other actions. So, here are some of the uh, instruments you can use. Rewards. You can bribe people. I mean, in some countries, you know, political parties pay money to people to vote for them. And there are various, but bribes are common everywhere. <coughs> Have you seen this uh, world corruption scale? Yes. You know which countries are in the bottom and which countries are in the top? Yeah. It's an interesting list to study. And uh, you can see how much... Uh, yeah, monetary. Uh, money isn't the only way you can bribe people, but it's maybe the most common. Uh, you can also give them more symbolic, you can praise people and so on. And emotional, give people emotional support to various types. And you have, sometimes you have power already and you can use that to get more power. Control is similar. Some cases you can actually use punishment, threats, and coercion as instruments. You can give judgments. Um, it's very one of the common, most common ways of exercising leadership is to say that was very good. Can you do that once more? That's a judgment, right? Or that was not so good. Maybe you should try to do it in a different way. You know, so things like that, those are judgments, and those are typical instruments of leadership. And you can use planning, planning and strategies. One important thing is to establish trust in you. We talked about that before, democratic leadership. You should establish trust in you, confidence, and other attitudes which are of the same nature. If you have that, it's much easier to lead. And for example, then that could be followed by inspiring people, making them enthusiastic, etc. So those are all uh, important instruments of getting uh, people to actively move in, a, in the way you would like them to move. Okay, in the literature they discuss a few different uh, ways of motivating people. And uh, very often you will see these terms, the Pygmalion and Galatea effects. Has anybody seen this? Never? You will see it if you read the book. <laughs> I can see nobody has been reading the book yet. 
Good. Okay. And this comes from uh, from antiquity, and we are talking about a person in antiquity, Pygmalion, who was making a statue, and he fell in love with his statue. The name of the statue was Galatea. He inspired the statue so much that the that the statue came to life. Okay. So the idea, this, this is, the Galatea effect is that you um, try, somehow you get your leaders or followers to have the same goals as you have. And then they try to, by their own force, live up to those expectations. That's the Galatea effect. You have self-motivated uh, followers. The Pygmalion effect <coughs> is that you somehow... Uh, Show them that you have high expectations. Then they try to live up to your expectations. This is illustrated. Um, you know the George Bernard Shaw play Pygmalion, which was later made into a musical called My Fair Lady? Okay, so you know the poor flower girl. This was actually modeled on this antique story. So the flower girl is like the statue, okay? And um, Professor Higgins had these expectations about how Eliza Doolittle should behave, and she started to behave more and more like that. And so that's the Pygmalion effect. Okay, um, this, this again, you will see this if you start to read your books. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah? From the worst angel, maybe. Uh, it's really hard to know what we're supposed to read on mental substance. I'm not books. the right person to ask that kind of questions. Yeah, but then it's hard to say that we're supposed to read the book when it's like Why not? in class or something. Just read everything. It's my, if you ask me, read as many books as you can and read them now. Do you think we'll remember everything from three books? Yes, if you have a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, as soon as I get questions of that sort, I said read more. <laughs> and think more, <laughs> and discuss more. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. You have to ask, uh, is it Pierre who asked this course not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ask him. He will give a better answer than, than I can. Uh, okay, now we come to the uh, resources of leadership. How can you become a good leader? Well, you have personal competence. Money is a resource. Uh, ever heard, do we have anybody from Italy here? You've heard of Mr. Berlusconi, right? Yes. yes. He made a very big fortune before he became a political leader. He used that fortune in a very skillful way to become, what was he, the Prime Minister of Italy for more than 20 years? Kennedy family. You realize that the Kennedy family all came from a multi-millionaire family. Kennedys were extremely rich. America actually shows many examples of people who made big fortune before they became political leaders, and then they used that fortune to, to become leaders. In many countries, the armed forces are a resource, and sometimes the generals themselves take over. What's the latest country where this happened? Egypt? Yes, another country. Anybody from Egypt here? Mr. Sisi? And uh, what about, there's another country where it happened also this year? Pakistan. No. Iran? No. Thailand? Thailand, yes, Thailand. Thailand threw out the gov uh, democratic government and there was a military coup and uh, the general is now calling himself president. Yeah. So it happens, right? And propaganda, of course. Big, big resource of leadership. Also within, of course, uh, you know, not just political, within companies. You will have uh, newsletters, you will have various types of information which is intended to keep the organization together and to make people feel enthusiasm for the for the leader of the company. Okay, what are the different environments we have to take into account? The different situations in which leadership can be exercised. Well, you see here we have the culture, 
different cultures have different expectations about leadership. Not everybody, you know, in, in some cultures authoritarian leaders might be much more respected than liked. In some cultures they like this American type democratic leader. In some countries they might even like a you know, less fair leader. I don't know. So cultures, nations, what kind of organization are you in? An industrial company might like one type of leaders. A university, if you look at the people who are the uh, vice chancellors or rectors or deans, they're another type of leader. Military generals. And then we have the activity. Leading a, a football team. Or, uh, you know, leading this kind of, uh, what do you call it, uh, hop jobs. When <laughs> you're hopping up and down or singing. Okay. <laughs> So, so all of these things, uh, of course, they, they need different kinds of leadership. So that, that's another, just as there are different kinds of leaders, there are different kinds of activities acquiring leadership. And there's a kind of harmony between the kind of leader and the kind of leadership, hopefully. How can communication be an instrument of leadership? This is the last question we have time to uh, discuss today. And let's see, let's see if we can say something about that. Well, we probably have to start by analyzing different types of communication. So we know that there are ways of communicating like direct face-to-face, -face. there's written, there's telephone, there's various electronically supported ways. And we, of course, if we had a communication strategy to go with leadership, we'd have to think about which, which kinds of leadership requires what type of communication. When should we send emails? When should we have, I don't know, an announcement on YouTube? When should I say, I want to talk to you later? <laughs> and you come to my room. <laughs> and then I'll tell you a few things, okay. So, very often people don't like to be... Um, if you're in a big meeting, and I was going to start to criticize you, which of course I don't want to do, because you're a great guy, so I'm not going to do that. But if I, you know, wanted to criticize you, I should say to him, come to my room, and then I'll tell him later, right? <laughs> So, that, you, know, you, you always have to make choices of this type. So, the, the, there's a kind of, um, yeah, so a communication uh, strategy had to, has to involve choosing different types of communication at different uh, moments in time. Yeah, so this, this whoop, what happened? I put off my battery, is that it? Schedule, I don't know what this is. Come back. This, this is, of course, connected with this second dimension here, degree of interactivity. When can you have one-way communication, like this lecture, where I try to have some interactive, but it's still a lot of one-way? And when is a more interactive mode of operation the best? So classical leadership role, of course, makes you think of one-way communication. People giving directives, giving big speeches, etc. But, of course, in more democratic, more egalitarian organizations, maybe you need much more interaction. <clears throat> so, uh, there, there's actually a lot more to say about that, but I see we're sort of running out. And maybe that's uh, what, you know, you have to use everything you learned about communication and try to put it in this perspective of leadership. What should be communicated to whom, in what way, etc. So that's all I have to say right now. I guess I'm going to meet you again later on this afternoon, right? Or yes. Thank you. Thank you.